first to Pakistan. Just a few days ago, protests right outside capital Islamabad led to the resignation of the country's law minister. The army and the ISI's involvement in the truce deal was a rather open secret. But the Tehrike Labek, the group that led the protests, today put the facts on record, exposing Pakistan's military. Soon after the Islamist protests ended in Islamabad, a Pakistani army ranger was caught on tape handing out 1,000 rupees in cash to the Tehrik e Labek protesters. <laughs> Tehrik e Labek's chief, Khadim Hussain Rizvi, has now confirmed what was being said all along. The military made the former law minister, Zahid Hamid, resign. <laughs> The talks had failed, then the army intervened. My members of Tariq interacted with the army and the ISI generals. They said your demands will be met. They ensured Zayed Hamid's resignation. Some analysts in Pakistan believe that this sets a dangerous precedent as it legitimizes hardliners in Pakistan. The true tragedy of it, I think, is the fact that the civilians had all the power to negotiate this. They had the power to resolve this peacefully, amicably. Um, they had a lot of time to set up negotiations. Um, they had a lot of time to speak to these people and try and figure out a solution that everyone could agree to. But they didn't. And in Pakistan, it seems that the army is now brought in to solve just about every situation that the civilian government is technically responsible for. The Tehreek al-Abek is a hardline Islamic political party which is trying to create space for itself in mainstream politics. In the recent Lahore by-election, the party won more than 7,000 votes. So why is the military helping the radicals out? Tehreek al-Abek's efforts to enter politics are well supported by the country's military establishment. While the army denies its tacit support to such groups, it has on several occasions made a pitch to mainstream radicals in the country. Your report, Beyond. Islamabad's weeks long siege by the fundamentalist Tehreek e Labek against an allegedly blasphemous law minister has ended after the army deployed its 111 brigade and the Pakistan government bowed meekly to all demands made by the Islamist group in an agreement. The ground situation in Pakistan is strongly reminiscent of the four coups staged in the past 70 years. Senior foreign editor Padma Rao reads the signs this time and asks, is Pakistan on the verge of another military takeover? Hafiz Saeed, one of the world's most wanted Islamist terrorists, has been freed. He is preparing his newly formed political party for the general election next year. An elected prime minister has been sacked on corruption charges. An Islamist group has held the capital Islamabad to ransom for weeks with nationwide support from fundamentalists. A shaky caretaker government has collapsed like a failed souffle, called in the army and agreed to all demands made by the Islamists. And now, the latest, an exiled general waiting in the wings for political support to return to Pakistan has just sent signals of love to global terrorist Saeed. To Shakespeare, the Pakistani skies would seem to be blazing forth the death of democracy. In other words, the best weather conditions prevail for a military takeover of Pakistan. Army Chief General Kamar Bajwa was considered a moderate. Indeed, he was elevated to that role by the disgraced Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif because the latter perceived no threat from Bajwa. But that may be the general's biggest disadvantage now. There are few Pakistanis who hold Sharif in any esteem right now. Importantly, some Sharif haters are those army seniors who were ignored by the ex-PM in favour of Bajwa for the highest military post. The army's other arm, the ISI, is also marbled with fundamentalist veins. The country's 111 brigade is already in position, ostensibly to ensure the smooth withdrawal of protesters. But they themselves are yet to return to their barracks. All stakeholders in the general election slated August 2018 seem anxious to bear their respective positions on television. Like Islamabad's chief protester, Khadim Rizvi, who has just confirmed the closeness between radicals and the army, which seems to be inching closer in this way to power in Pakistan. Listen in. 
ان سے تو ہم نے کہا آپ سے بات ہی نہیں ہو سکتی پھر فوج درمیان میں پڑی ہمارے ساتھی جو مذاکرات والے تھے تو انہوں نے ہماری پارٹ وہ ساتھی ہیں ہمارے انہوں نے کی ہے تاریخ کے ہیں فوج کے ساتھ کی ہے وہ آئی ایس آئی کے کوئی بڑے ہوں گے جنرل وغیرہ اور جن کے سائن ہیں معاہدے میں شاید وہی ہے انہیں کے ساتھ تو کیا ان کے ساتھ پھر کیسے کسی نتیجے پر انہوں نے کہا جو آپ کہتے ہیں آپ کی بات منظور کرواتے ہیں اچھا یعنی زاہد حامد کا استیفہ انہوں نے دلوایا انہوں نے دلوایا There was a clear and present hint of his popularity when tens and thousands of supporters greeted global terrorist Hafiz Saeed when he was released. And via television, he just received another unexpected boost to his fortunes from former coup leader and President Parvez Musharraf, who expressed admiration for the Kashmir terror wrought by Saeed's group, the Lashkar-e Taiba, and its so-called humanitarian arm. Musharraf was exiled on charges of treason by his nemesis Nawaz Sharif, whom he had toppled in a coup himself. But none other than General Raheel Sharif, the army chief who just retired and made way for Bajwa, had helped Musharraf flee the country. Obviously, there is more than a modicum of support for Musharraf within the Pakistan army. But to return to Pakistan and possibly political power, Musharraf will also need Pakistan's Islamist militants, especially the object of his affection and admiration, Hafiz Saeed's Lashkar-e-Taiba, whose solitary goal is the genocide of Indians to claim India's Jammu and Kashmir. Padma Rao, we on. Pakistan has been ruled for more than half of its lifespan by its army. And if there is one entity that has maintained control over all forms of Islamist militants in Pakistan, it is the men in uniform. Let's take a look at Pakistan's long history under military rule, under which observers say the country has enjoyed the maximum stability. The situation on the ground was perfect for a military takeover. There was widespread dissatisfaction over Pakistan's 1956 constitution. The country saw a flurry of prime ministers, four of them in two years. The president, himself an army general, declared martial law and appointed General Ayub Khan as prime minister. The latter usurped all powers and ruled for 11 years, forcing the president to resign. Turmoil again over the results of elections in East and West Pakistan, General Yahya Khan took over, delayed sharing power with Sheikh Mujibur Rahman in Dhaka, and the freedom movement swelled. Bangladesh was born. This general ruled only for two years before he handed over power to Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and remained under house arrest himself. Another election, more turmoil, convincing Pakistan's army yet again that martial law was the only answer. General Ziaul Haq took over, arrested tried and executed Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. The general is the longest serving head of state in Pakistan so far. His brand of martial law was considered strict but modern. General Zia also encouraged religious fundamentalism in that country. Pakistan enjoyed a stable GDP and the maximum economic prosperity under this general. Barely 11 years after General Zia's era, tensions surfaced between Pakistan's civil and government and the Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and his army chief, General Parvez Musharraf, in a dramatic turn of events as General Musharraf's plane was preparing to land in Pakistan, his army loyalists arrested the Prime Minister and declared martial law. Musharraf declared himself president in 2001 and won himself another five years in office through a controversial referendum in 2002. Pakistan's economy, we have to say, improved under his rule. So did liberal social values. But he fled abroad to escape impeachment and charges of treason. He remains overseas, announcing his return to Pakistan politics every now and then.